Hey guys, welcome back to my channel, and if you're new to my channel, hello, my name is Gabby, and welcome. So today's case is one that I've known about for a while, and I know I've said that in quite a few videos lately, but there are cases that I've had in the back of my head for about two years now since I really started researching into cold cases and doing true crime on my channel, and they've always kind of been off to the side, and I've always said, like, I have to get to that video, I have to get to that video, so this year I'm trying to get all those cases done that I've been really wanting to talk about, and this is definitely one of those cases. This case has a little bit of everything. It has people who are missing, people who have been murdered, unfortunately, people who have been found, it has to do with a serial killer, the internet's first serial killer, actually, fraud, I mean, the list goes on and on. And on my channel, I really honestly don't like focusing on just the serial killer. I have done a few serial killer videos in the past, and I usually just like focusing on the victims as much as I can, and in this video, I'm going to be focusing on mostly just one victim and I'm also going to of course be going into a little bit about the other victims as well but this one is going to be mostly focused on one victim kind of two but mostly one so with all that being said let's just get into it This is the case of Lisa Stacy and also her daughter, Tiffany Stacy. Lisa was born April 11th, 1965. In August of 1984, in Lisa's hometown of Huntsville, Alabama, 19-year-old Lisa Alleg married Carl Stacy, becoming Lisa Stacy. One month later, she gave birth to her daughter, Tiffany Lynn Stacy. Lisa and Carl were happy at first, like most couples. They originally were going to stay in Huntsville, but because of Carl's lack of insurance, they decided to move to Kansas City, a city on the eastern edge of Kansas at the border with Missouri. Their relationship got rocky pretty quickly, and by the end of the year, Carl had re-enlisted in the military and had moved to Illinois. While he was in Illinois, Lisa and her daughter Tiffany decided to move into the Hope House which was a shelter for battered women and their children, or women and their children who just so happened to be homeless. While she was living in the Hope House, a social worker introduced her to a man. This is a man who everybody wishes she had never met. She met a man named John Osborne, whose real name was actually John Edward Robinson, but she didn't know that at the time. He was just Mr. Osborne to her. This Mr. Osborne presented himself as a kind and helping soul to her. She trusted him. He introduced the idea of her joining the Kansas City Outreach Program, a program that he said would help her receive a free room and board while she was studying for her GED so she could create a better future for her and her daughter. Lisa jumped at the idea. In early January of 1985, Lisa and her daughter checked in the Roadway Inn located in Overland Park, Kansas, staying in room 131. When her relatives wondered how she could afford a motel, she told them Mr. Osborne had it covered. He was the one paying for all the accommodations. Lisa was still technically married to Carl at this time. When she told her sister-in-law, Kathy Klingensmith, the situation, Kathy told her to be careful of this man because you never know people's true intentions. Lisa reassured her that she was safe. During the evening of January 8th, 1985, Lisa's sister-in-law, Kathy, took in Tiffany for what was going to be a couple of days to watch her. On January 10th in the morning, Lisa came to pick Tiffany up. And when she got there, she said that Mr. Osborne was looking for her. So she used the phone to call back to the roadway in and speak to Mr. Osborne. About 25 minutes later, Mr. Osborne showed up to Kathy's house to pick up Lisa and Tiffany and go back to the motel. Lisa left behind her yellow Toyota Corolla and most of her belongings at Kathy's house. And when her and Tiffany left, that was the last time that Kathy would ever see her sister-in-law again. On the evening of January 10th, 
Lisa frantically called her mother-in-law, Carl's mother. She claimed Lisa was hysterical on the phone, telling his mother she heard she was going to try to get custody of Tiffany by claiming she was an unfit parent because she did not have a stable home for her daughter. Carl's mother had no idea what she was talking about and reassured her that the story was completely false. She would never do such a thing. Lisa calmed down and then told her that someone wanted her to sign four blank sheets of paper. This made no sense to her mother-in-law, but she urged Lisa to not sign anything. Then one of the weirdest things of all, Lisa said, here they come. She hung up the phone and that was the last time anyone heard from Lisa again. Kathy found out that Lisa had checked herself and Tiffany out of the motel room later on during the day of January 10th. When a day passed and no word from Lisa, she had a gut feeling and reported the mother and daughter missing. Kathy determined that this Mr. Osborne had paid for the motel with his company credit card. His company was called Equi2. Now when police looked up Equi2, it led them to a man named John Edward Robinson aka Mr. Osborne. That was the owner of this management consulting firm. During this time, Kathy's husband decided to take a trip to Mr. Robinson's office building. Apparently, the discussion went south very quickly. Robinson became very angry and made him leave the office building immediately. Kathy's husband knew that an innocent man would not lose his temper in such a way as Mr. Robinson did. Police started looking into this John Edward Robinson and they couldn't believe their findings. Apparently, Robinson had created the Kansas Outreach Program as a charitable extension of his company, Equi2. In late 1984, he went to the Truman Medical Center to discuss his program where he told them he was involved with Catholic charities. He wanted the center to refer women to his organization after their stay there. The administrators believed his claims at first and did want to work with him, but became extremely suspicious when he asked multiple times to specifically have them refer Caucasian women to his organization. The social worker at the facility had a feeling he was somehow involved in a baby brokering trade. This is exactly what the authorities began to suspect, that Robinson was using his company and charitable extension as a front for illegal baby brokering after Lisa and Tiffany had disappeared. But they had no solid proof though, it was only a theory at this point. Then two months later, Robinson went to the police and he told them that he knows a woman who had recently had Lisa babysit for her. So obviously she couldn't be dead because she babysat for this woman. And he told police that this woman told him that Lisa had confided in her that she never wanted to see her family again and that's why she disappeared. Lisa's family knew that this was a completely made up story. When police tracked down this woman and questioned her about Robinson's claims, she broke down and told them the truth. She said that he had blackmailed her into going along with the story and that she actually had no idea who Lisa was nor had she ever met her. Just like everyone figured. Then like any liar would do who's trying to cover his tracks and come up with some sort of story as to why he's innocent and he didn't do anything and this person's still alive, he told police that what actually happened was Lisa came to his office one day with somebody named Bill and told him that she was moving to Colorado and she was going to start a new life. After these changes in his story and the fact he was the last known individual to see Lisa and Tiffany, they suspected he was involved in their disappearance. But of course, like I said before, they had no solid evidence to tie him to any crime. So they hit a dead end. Months and months passed and then near the end of 1985, Lisa's family members and also employees at Hope House, where Lisa and Tiffany stayed once, started receiving letters that were supposedly written by Lisa. Ironically, this was around the same time police fully suspected Robinson's involvement in their missing persons case. Remember when I brought up before about Lisa telling her mother-in-law that someone wanted her to sign blank papers? 
Well, it's believed Robinson forged the letters, but the signature at the bottom was actually that of Lisa Stacy's, signed before she disappeared. There's a few things about these letters that made police super suspicious, but the main thing was that it started to look like Lisa's case was connected to another one. A 19-year-old woman named Paula Godfrey disappeared from the Overland Park area in Kansas on September 1st, 1984, after accepting a job from none other than Mr. Robinson. Not only that, but her family also received letters that were supposedly written by Paula after she vanished. There was no solid proof though. Lisa, her daughter Tiffany, and Paula just all happened to disappear with a connection to one man. John Edward Robinson did go to prison though in 1987, but it was for fraud and theft charges. By the year 1990, he had suffered multiple strokes and as a result could barely talk anymore. In 1991, he was released from prison and started working in the mobile home industry and was quickly known around the area for being very untrustworthy when it came to his business. Back in the year 1987 though, the year he went to prison, before he did, a 27-year-old woman named Catherine Clampett went missing from Overland Park. She just so happened to be an employee of, you guessed it, John Edward Robinson. But again, no solid proof, just a vanished woman. Then in the mid 1990s, he was a free man and started using the internet in disgusting ways. He used the screen name Slave Master and would convince women to involve themselves with him in very sexual situations. Now this is a huge part of this case and a huge part of the case about this serial killer, but it's something I don't want to go too in detail with in this video. But the entire point is, is that by 1999, he was charged with multiple accounts of sexual assault. Police started further looking into Robinson after these accusations and they got search warrants and what they found after finally getting these search warrants would be something none of them would ever forget. They discovered that his name was linked to a farmland he owned that had a storage shed on the property. Outside the shed, they found two barrels. Inside the two 55-gallon metal barrels, they found the bodies of Isabella Luvisca and Suzette Trouden. When it came to Isabella, she was a Polish immigrant whose family thought she was traveling over in Europe. Robinson, again, covered his tracks and forged letters to her family. They thought she was fine for this entire period of time. They were devastated and beyond shocked to hear the news about what happened to their daughter. Then all the way across state lines in Missouri, in a storage unit owned by Robinson, they found more barrels. These contained the bodies of three other women. Beverly Bonner was the first. She was a prison librarian who fell for Robinson while he was in jail, and they continued the romance after he was released. The other two were Sheila Faith, and her 15-year-old disabled daughter, Debbie Faith. When it came to Sheila and her daughter, her daughter was disabled, and because of that, she received disability checks. And Robinson acted interested in Sheila, and he was cashing the disability checks for six years. The thing that absolutely blew police's minds was the fact that they were really looking for Lisa, her daughter, Tiffany, Paula and Catherine, they knew that it was just too fishy that four people disappeared with a connection to this man. They knew that he had some involvement in their disappearance. And then they end up finding five other women's bodies. His wife, Nancy, who had been unaware of her husband's double life for all those years, she knew about his involvement with fraud, but nothing more than that. She did the right thing and testified against him, against her own husband, during his trial in 2001 regarding the disappearance of Tiffany Stacy. Nancy claimed that in January of 1985, she remembered her husband bringing home a baby, a baby girl who was quite dirty. They didn't have the supplies to take care of her, but washed her up and bought her clothing and 
some baby supplies. This baby was given to Robinson's brother and sister-in-law who were unable to bear children. They were told the baby's mother had committed suicide and left the child behind. They paid thousands for her and signed fake paperwork they were given by Robinson. They named the baby Heather Robinson. Her real name though was Tiffany Stacy. They did a DNA test in November of 2000 and Heather and Carl Stacy were a match. She was in fact his daughter. In the year 2000, Heather Robinson, or Tiffany Stacy, was 16 years old. And could you imagine being, I mean, any age, but especially in your teenage years, I mean, you're going through so many changes as it is, and she was almost an adult, and she knew that she was adopted, but finding out that your uncle is a serial killer who took the lives of many women not only that, but he was responsible for your mother's death. You thought that all these years your mother had taken her own life and that wasn't the true story. According to a 2000 article for Chicago Tribune, Kathy Klingen Smith, Tiffany's aunt, said she often wondered what happened to her niece, convinced the girl would eventually return. We were just hoping that someday we would find the baby. I think we always thought deep down that something terrible had happened to Lisa, but we always hoped that the baby was okay. Although she knows the little girl has grown up with a different name, she still refers to her as Tiffany. In 2002, Robinson stood trial for the murders of Suzette Troughton, Isabella Lovisca, and Lisa Stacy, along with lesser charges. It was at the time the longest criminal trial in the history of the state of Kansas, and he was convicted on all counts. He received the death sentence for the murders of Suzette and Isabella and life in prison for Lisa, only because Lisa was murdered before Kansas had reinstated the death penalty. He also received 20 years in prison for interfering with a parent's custody when he took Tiffany away from her parents. He received 20 and a half years in prison for kidnapping Troughton and also seven months for theft. He also received a life sentence for the murders of Godfrey, Clampett, Bonner, and the Faiths. Robinson currently remains on death row in El Dorado Correctional Facility in Kansas. As of right now, Robinson has eight known victims. Paula Godfrey, 19, remains never found. Lisa Stacy, 19, remains never found. Catherine Clampett, 27, remains never found. Beverly Bonner, 49, remains found. Sheila Faith, 45, and her daughter, Debbie Faith, 15, remains found. Isabella Luvisca, 21, remains found. Suzette Troughton, 28, remains found. In the year 2006, Lisa Stacy's daughter filed a civil suit against Truman Medical Center and social worker Karen Gaddis because Karen Gaddis was the social worker at the center who introduced Lisa to Robinson after her stay there. The next year, they reached a settlement though and Heather Robinson, or Tiffany Stacy, split all the money with her biological grandmother. She kept her adoptive name, Heather Robinson though, of course, because that's what she grew up with, that's what she's been known for and she said that she had an amazing upbringing and she was shown nothing but love from her adoptive parents. She claimed that her adoptive father was nothing like his brother and she said that her adoptive parents had no idea the truth either. That same year she reached a second judgment which would basically prevent John Edward Robinson from profiting off of any books or film or anything that would bring in money about the case or about her mother or about his life and I feel like this was a really good move on her part. So basically he's not able to make any profit off of telling about his life himself or about the crimes that he committed. There was also a barrel found in 2006 in a rural area of Iowa that contained an unknown woman's body. A Jane Doe. 
the body was estimated to have been decaying for about 20 years. It's assumed that Robinson could have an involvement in that homicide as well because he did have business partners in that area. He'll never tell though, just like he'll never tell where the remains of Lisa, Paula, or Catherine are. One investigator said, He's maintained the secret about what he's done with the women he won't ever tell. It's the last control that he's got. There are probably other barrels waiting to be opened, other bodies waiting to be found. Because most of his victims that he met after 1993 were met through chat rooms, he is known as the internet's first serial killer. So that is the case of Lisa Stacy and of course the many others who lost their lives because of this sick Sick individual. This is definitely a case that has sat with me for a while and I have a lot of opinions about. It's just, it really is insane to me that for so long police knew that Robinson had some involvement in these women's disappearances and they just couldn't do anything about it because there was no solid proof. Because they had no evidence and they just vanished other people lost their lives, and that's just completely heartbreaking to me. When it comes to Lisa, Paula, and Catherine's remains, I always say in most of my videos that there's someone somewhere that knows something, and I truly believe that the only person in this case who knows where their remains are located is Robinson himself, and that's information he is never going to tell. That's something that I just find unbelievable that you're responsible for this, you took their lives, and the least you could do is tell authorities where their remains are located so they can possibly have a proper burial, a plot where their family can go visit them, but he can't even do that. I do have to give a warning because most of you guys, after you watch my video, like to do a little bit of researching on your own. I'm the exact same way, but be cautious because there are post-mortem photos and crime scene photos online that, if you're researching, will eventually pop up and they are very, very hard to look at. I have seen a lot of crime scene photos because this is what I do, this is my job, but these are by far some of the worst and I just have to, of course, let you guys know that because I don't want anybody coming across anything and getting upset that I didn't let you all know. So while you're researching, keep that in the back of your mind. Let me know your opinions down below about this case. I love getting into discussions with you guys in the comments. And if you really don't have anything to say, at least put a little heart down below in the comments because you never know what family members may come across this video and, you know, just showing a little bit of love to them. So a little heart down below if anything. Before I leave this video though, I need to ask for a little bit of help. Now, one case that is very, very dear to me, that is the case of Christy Gwen O'Pry. I did a video on it a while back and her family is some of the sweetest people. Her sister is absolutely amazing. Her sister Amy is one of the kindest people I have ever talked to in my entire life. She even helped me create my website. Now, in that video, I did discuss how they dedicated a non-profit shelter to Christy. They had one main van that they would use to transport the dogs to the shelter, to the vet, and transport food and medicine, and they had a ton of food and medicine in this van and supplies and the van caught fire not long ago. They not only are trying to replace the van, but also over 500 pounds of food and medicine and other supplies that they lost in this fire, and they created a donation link, and I'm going to put that donation link in the description of this video. Anything will help, anything at all, even a dollar, just this is something that I definitely care about so much and I'm going to be helping out myself, so just consider it if you can afford to donate anything. If you made it this far in the video, thank you for taking a little bit of time out of your day to watch my video. If you have any video ideas for me, any case recommendations, leave those down below in the description and I will see you guys in the next one. Bye guys.